This video is going to be our, our kind of first introduction to the for looping structure in Visual Basic and the if decision structure in Visual Basic. So the concept of the for loop is it's the idea of allowing us to loop or repeat something. It's very common in a program to repeat a particular action. The if statement is also a very, very common use in most programs and that allows us to make a decision or make a choice about what we want to do at a certain point in our program. So we're going to just go ahead and take a look at some code examples here. But we have a bunch of random numbers here on the sheet. Um, we have 10 random numbers on the sheet in this, these cells you see right here. So in Visual Basic, the very first thing you're going to notice is I've declared a variable called start row. And that's going to hold the value of where I want to start when I process the rows of my spreadsheet. And that's just a variable I made up. You know, it's a good idea to come up with good names. You might also notice that I'm starting my variable names with a lowercase letter. And if I have multiple words in my variable name, I start each subsequent word with an uppercase letter. I strongly encourage you to use this same naming style for your variables. You normally start with a letter. If you have multiple words, use uppercase for each subsequent word in your variable name. But do start with a lowercase letter. I have an end row variable here, and the end row variable, of course, is going to allow me to specify what is the ending row that I want to process on my spreadsheet. And finally, I have this column variable, which allows me to specify, of course, which column I want to process on my worksheet. So in this particular case, it makes a lot of sense that my starting row value would be assigned to a 1, my ending row value would be 10, and of course, my column number was column 1. So first things first, we're just going to take a look at an example of a for loop. Now, a for loop has to have a variable declared that's going to be used for that particular for loop. Now, you can reuse this variable for subsequent for loops, but we have to declare the variable for our for loop. So, I've declared a variable called counter, and as you can imagine, it's going to count from start row to end row, and it's just going to go up by one. So, let's take a look at what that for loop looks like. So, the for loop basically has a very simple syntax. It starts with the keyword for, and then you have to have your variable that you've declared for your for loop. So, of course, the variable that we've declared for this for loop is counter. And that variable is going to be assigned a starting value. So you'll notice the use of the assignment operation here in the beginning of our for loop. So the, the for loop, when, it re, when it's reached in your code, gets assigned that starting value. In this case, the start row value will be 1. So it'll assign that to our variable here for the for loop. And you also have to specify what your ending value is for your loop. So I often refer to these for loops as a counting loop because it's going to count from some starting value to some ending value. And that value will be known by the time we get to this piece of code in our program. There better be a number in this variable and in this variable. And of course there will be because all variables have a value. So in this particular program, of course, if we refer back to our variables up here, we'll note that the start row is going to be 1, and it's going to go to the end row, which is 10. So this variable is going to be assigned a 1 to start with. So all we're going to do is, with our message boxes, we're just going to display what's in those cells as this loop executes. So what we say here in our cells code here, we just basically say we want the counter variable, which we know is going from 1 to 10, so the very first time we execute the statement, the counter variable will have a 1. And then the column variable, of course, is going to be column 1, because all of our numbers are in column 1. So the very first time the body of this loop executes, counter will be 1 and column will be 1. So it's just like saying cells 1, comma 1. Once the message box executes, we come around and we have this little piece of syntax that says next counter. For every for loop you create, you have to have a next statement. And notice the indenting. The body of the for loop is indented one tab stop. So next counter. Well, if we just count up by one, next counter will mean go to two. So it goes to two. And then we come around on our loop again at the top. And it says cells two comma one. And it displays that value. So this goes two, three, four, five, up to our end value here, our end row, which would be 10. So this loop executes 10 times, displaying each cell in turn. Let's go down and look at our next little sample piece of code here. 
Now this code is going to do exactly the same thing. Notice it says exactly the same thing. Counter equals start row to end row. And down here we have next counter, exactly the same thing. So this tells us then that this loop is going to go around 10 times. It's going to start at 1 and go up by 1 to 10. But we're doing something a little different in this particular piece of code. In this particular code we have an if statement. And the if statement is always going to do a test. And our test in this particular case is to check and see if the cell we're currently looking at is less than zero. That's our test. So the syntax for the if statement has if, you have to always have a test of some sort, and then the keyword then. You'll notice that every if statement also has to have an end if. So the if statement has a matching end if. I actually often type the if statement at the top here first, type the then, and then immediately type end if. The body of the if statement, of course, can be any code you wish. And notice how that's indented one tab stop. So the body of this if statement is a very simple statement. It simply says, if that cell is less than zero, what we're going to do is we're going to execute this statement, which actually just changes that value to a one. So if we have a negative number, it's just going to change it to a one. So it takes whatever cell, row, and column we have here and changes that cell to a 1. So why don't we just go ahead and execute this code and see what happens. So I'm just going to hit go and immediately it comes up and gives me a 6 because it's displaying each cell in turn starting at row 1, column 1. So it should just go through all of the values. 6, 10, negative 10, 5, and so on. I'm just going to click through these. And there's the negative 6. That's the last number. Now the next thing it's going to do is it's going to go right over all those cells again and replace all the negative values with a 1. Now this is going to happen instantly because the computer is just so fast. So as soon as I click OK, we should see 1's replacing every one of those negative numbers. And it immediately ended because it did its job. And there are 1's in every one of those cells. If I put my little pause in there, we could have seen the 1's actually change. But now you can see those are ones. But what is going on here with these negative numbers? That's confusing. And I'll tell you exactly what's going on because it is a little confusing and it's somewhat my fault. In the formulas for every one of these cells, I actually had a rand between. A rand between negative 10 and 10. So it was putting a random number into all these cells using the rand between formula. Well, you'll notice in the cells where I have the 1, there's just a 1 because it overwrote the rand between that was in all those cells with positive with negative numbers. So any cell that has a 1 in it then is going to have that um, just that number unless of course the rand between actually generated a 1. So that I'm sorry it was a little bit confusing but at the same time it's kind of interesting to see that rand between remaining in those cells. So every time this sheet recalculates of course I get a uh, I don't know why it's not recalculating right now, but when I recalculate the sheet, it gives me a new number. So we go to formula, let's see, where's the calculation button? There it is, calculate now. So there's a new recalculation, and notice all of the values that didn't have the 1 are getting a brand new random value between negative 10 and 10. But any of the cells that I actually assigned the 1 to, they stay the same. So again, what's going on there? we assigned a 1 to those cells that used to have a formula in them. So you should definitely type in this code and play around with this and see what happens. You might want to try to add some additional numbers, change your start row to a different value, change your end row to a different value, maybe put some numbers in a different column and change the column number here so that it's column 2 or 3. Maybe put something different into those cells instead of just a 1. You could put a 0. You could put a text string in there, you know, just by typing quote and then some text string end quote. But definitely play around for this. You also, of course, can do the step where you hit the F8 key and just step through your program and watch that program execute. And you'll notice how it goes around through the for loop and executes that for loop in turn incrementing the counter. Notice the counter now is up to four. It'll increment that counter as it goes through the for loop. So I encourage you to use that step operation. That's F8 on your keyboard and step your program and watch it execute and play around with this. Thank you.